This week at St. B, July 17th, Anne's Closet will run from 11 until 1 p.m. July 18th, we'll have Bingo at 10.30 a.m. July 19th, it'll be Family Game Night at 6 p.m. Please note, July 14th through August the 18th, it is hard to believe that once again, back-to-school season is upon us. This year, in the loop of back-to-school bash, we will be collecting school supplies and food for fuel. You are invited and encouraged to bring any or all of the following. Applesauce cups, pudding cups, granola bars, number two, non-mechanical pencils, 
crayons, folders, wide ruled paper, and hand sanitizer. Please be sure to check expiration dates on any food items. Uh, they prefer nothing that expires before October of 2024, please. Also, Nita will be departing for Guatemala soon. Please keep Nita and her mission in your thoughts and prayers. Upper rooms are available at either sanctuary entrance to guide your daily devotional. And as always, please fill out your attendance pad at the end of your queue to let us know you were with us in worship this morning. Good morning. I feel like I had a note about the back to school bash and then it entirely left my brain. So please, you are encouraged to bring whatever you can. Last week you couldn't hear me and I had to yell. This week I'm trying not to yell. It is a joy though to worship with all of you this morning. I now remember what my note was. Next week we will be celebrating communion again. We will be partaking in communion together. We will also be blessing elements for Nita to take on her trip to Guatemala so that she and her team can take communion while they are there. We will also be praying over Nita to commission her for this trip. Most importantly, whether this is your first time or you've been attending for years, whether you're strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. When we witness our work bear good fruit and rejoice in all God has done among us, we gather for worship. When misunderstanding and misinformation threaten to divide instead of unite us, we gather in When we dance together in the joy of knowing we belong to God and one another, we gather When we stumble and bumble our way forward as God's grace guides us into greater love and deeper communion, we gather I invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing together hymn number 662, Stand Up and Bless the Lord.
their purposes and extravagant blessings. We come to praise you. We come because we want to. We sing our songs because we are glad to. We pray for your grace because we need to. And we ask for the love of Christ in our hearts because without it, we are a dead loss. Please lift every shutter within our mind and open every door within our soul, that you, the Lord of glory, the God of countless hosts, may come in. Through Jesus Christ, the joy of loving hearts. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing together, Holy Ground. In 2272, it is only the chorus, so your insert has the verses as well. Margaret is going to play through the chorus and verse, and then we will join in singing. We will begin with the chorus and then go into verse one. Margaret and I will not let you go astray. It's going to be great. <laughs>
Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Samuel, verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and 12b through 19. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Utsa and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedidim to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded, girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Mishael, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, a whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and the cake of raisins, then all the people went back to their homes. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in late elementary school, I attended worship with my grandmother, and one of her friends, as we visited her friend's church. At the start of the service, the pastor stood up and began apologizing to the congregation. He apologized for the events that had taken place in worship the previous week. He was on vacation and had not approved the actions that had happened. He adamantly condemned what had happened and promised the congregation that it would never happen again. Desperate to know what happened, I was thrilled when at lunch my grandmother's friend began explaining what happened the previous week. The youth director was in charge of worship. And as part of worship, the youth had done a choreographed liturgical dance down the center aisle of the church. And if that wasn't bad enough, they were barefoot. And they were wearing jeans. And those jeans were cuffed up a couple rolls. Their actions were viewed as disrespectful and inappropriate. In his commentary on today's text in Feasting on the Word, Miguel de la Torre writes, Our cultural need to control events too often stifles the very presence of God from being manifested. Sometimes congregations prohibit expressions of joy, dancing, drumming, guitars, instruments, modern music, and so forth, as if their inclusion somehow violated God's will. Our churches would be revolutionized if we were to allow God's people to worship freely without restraints. This morning we begin a seven-week dive into 2 Samuel, following 
David and the ways in which he invites us into living our lives as a form of worship, as an offering to God. Worship wasn't something David did. It wasn't a specific time or day of the week. Rather, worship was who he was. David lived and breathed worship. Yes, sometimes David got it wrong. Sometimes he followed impulses that led him astray. And sometimes he got confused about who was the object of this worship and got in the way of the God he loved. But through it all, David lived as though his life was an offering to God. By nature of the lectionary, it is impossible to hear the entirety of a story in one sitting. However, it is important to recognize that what we just heard read aloud is just a piece of the greater narrative. This is evident as we hear the first verse that was read this morning. David, again, gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. This is not the first time David has gathered the men of Israel. In chapter 5, the previous chapter, we hear the story of David becoming king, taking over Jerusalem, and defeating the Philistines. Reading this opening verse of chapter 6 changes a little bit, as we know the ongoing conflict between the Israelites and, well, basically everyone else the conquests, the exiles, the returns. Why else would David need to gather all the chosen men again if not for another threat already? We then quickly learn, though, that David is gathering everyone so that a celebration can occur as the Ark of the Covenant is brought into Jerusalem. The immediate threat of conquest is nullified. They are safe and they are celebrated. Dr. Emily and Amelia Nagowski are twin sisters and they have done extensive research on burnout and specifically the stress cycle. They wrote a book called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And in the first chapter, they explain the difference between our stress and our stressors. They define them as the following. Stressors are what activate the stress response in your body. They can be anything you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, or imagine could do you harm. There are external stressors, work, money, family, time, cultural norms and expectations, experiences of discrimination, and so on. And there are less tangible internal stressors, self-criticism, body image, identity, memories, and the future. Stress, though, is the neurological and physiological shift that happens in your body when you encounter one of these threats. It's an evolutionarily adaptive response that helps us cope with things like, say, being chased by a lion or charged by a hippo. Your body and mind change in response to a perceived threat. And so once this stress response is activated, once the unnecessary functions are slowed, your body is ready to run. You run away from the lion. You run away from the hippo. You get back to your village who runs out to help you escape the threat. And then when the lion is vanquished, you celebrate together and you're grateful to be alive and you can finally relax. But sometimes the stressor the lion unexpectedly disappears. It gets 
struck by lightning while you're still running from it. And so the threat is neutralized, but your body is stuck in the stress cycle. Your, your brain knows that you are now safe, but your body doesn't. You haven't had to run, you haven't had to escape, but your body doesn't know that, and so it's still ready, it's still on edge. And so you have to do something to communicate to your body that it is safe. You run, you swim, you dance around your living room to, I don't know, Beyonce. And I can't help but imagine that this is part of what David is doing. They have reached safety. They are no longer under active threat. They are moving the ark back to Jerusalem. They are safe. But they have to be able to communicate that to their bodies and to those who were not necessarily there. They have to communicate that safety to those who stayed home worried about what is to come next. So David and all the house of Israel dance and sing and play music and rejoice and worship God. David's invitation is one that invites Israel to complete the stress cycle. And it does end. And the celebration picks back up in, in verse 12 as David brought the ark to the city of David with rejoicing. Except that I thought we'd already done that. I thought that this was the whole start. But the lectionary skips over some important verses. Because they're not exactly easy to hear verses. Verses 6 through 12 say, When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of of God. So David went to bring the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. I thought they were safe. I thought the threat had vanished and the stress cycle was complete. I thought we were already celebrating the ark returning to Jerusalem. But then for three months, our party gets put on hold, and the ark resides in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. For three months, David waited. He had made it through war several times, including the times when Saul wished he had it. He had become the king. He had completed the stress cycle and danced in front of the Lord. And then his understanding was turned upside down. How could the God they had just been worshiping strike down Uzzah for stabilizing the ark? The truth is, we don't know. The truth is that there are things about God and about Scripture that we will never 
No, at least not in this life. The truth is there are times when we are scared and our bodies react at the deepest physiological level. There's no account for what David does in those three months. He is just eventually told that the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom. He returns to collect the ark and complete the journey to Jerusalem. I can't help but think about the journey back to that house. The conversation going on about the blessings that have been placed upon them. The hesitancy of even going. The unknown of what they might find when they get there. But David arrives. And they begin their journey to Jerusalem once more. And they had taken six steps when David stops the procession to sacrifice an ox and a fatling and dance before the Lord with all his might. He is once again signaling to himself and to all of Israel the end of the stress cycle. As he dances, as he rejoices before the Lord. But the story also doesn't end there. Because sometimes the ways in which we express our joy, our relief, our worship, is looked upon with judgment and disgust. It is viewed as disrespectful and inappropriate. And we get a glimpse of this from Michael who despised David and her heart. Michael is a complicated character in our story today. She is Saul's younger daughter and David's first wife. Throughout the scriptures, we find her with agency. She speaks and conspires. She lies and moves and looks and despises and criticizes. (coughs) And she's also the object of patriarchal actions. She is given to David by Saul. For that story, see earlier in 1 Samuel. She is one of the few women in the Bible who is said to have loved the one to whom she is married. Throughout their marriage, Michael learns of her father's plan to kill David and conspires with David to save his life. When Saul discovers her deception, he marries her off to another man. And in her absence, David takes on several more wives, having children with each of them. And then after Saul's death and David's ascension to the throne, David requests that she is returned to him. And after the text we read this morning, we hear a disagreement between David and Michael, where he is harsh And she essentially becomes a living widow. David still has a claim over her. But she will not bear any children. She will live as though she is a slave. She will watch as he takes other wives and has children with them. But Saul's lineage will die So I can very much relate to her as she looks on as David dances in nothing more than a loincloth. He has the privilege of freely worshiping God without restraint, while 
she has nothing but questions and anger for a God over David, who is a man after God's own heart. She is living the injustice of the world, and David is dancing. There are times when we get stuck. We get stuck in trauma. We get stuck in questions. We get stuck in injustice. We get stuck in a divisive and often hostile division in our government. We are stuck in interpersonal relationships. We are stuck in jobs and homes and sometimes even our own minds. And sometimes it feels impossible to get unstuck. But when we're stuck, sometimes we have to stop the endless, exhausting struggle The ones that the more we try, the deeper we sink. <clears throat> because we have to tell our body that we are safe. So we take a deep breath. We dance around the living room. We belt out the Taylor Swift album that has the most beltable songs, we go for a run, we have coffee with a friend, we do something to interrupt the cycle that we have been stuck in for so long. And we know that none of this will stop the next round of stress in our lives. We know that things somehow continue to happen. We know that there will be times again when we feel utterly helpless. We know that there are times when nothing seems fair or just or good. But it is in those moments that we are reminded that it's okay to take a break and get back to your task later. David did. It is okay to celebrate the small steps along the way to the larger task. It is okay to see the goodness that is being experienced by another family. And it is okay if sometimes we relate more to Michael with anger in her heart than we do David dancing in front of the Lord because we are complex and complicated beings. And we worship a complex and complicated God. But the truth is, and the good news, is that this complicated, this complex God reminds us that we never face these things alone. The psalm for today's lectionary is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their Savior. Such is the generation of those who will seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is, who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Thanks be to God. Oh God, pour out your spirit upon these, our gifts. 
gifts that have been graciously given to us that we now humbly return to you. May they be used to further your kingdom on earth so that all might experience your abundant love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to keep Janice's cousin Diane in our prayers. She got some hard, life-changing news last week, and so we keep her in our prayers. My mother is a joy in surgery, as usual. Uh, the surgery went perfect, but now she's on a month-long hard recovery. We continue to keep Doyle's mother in our prayers as both a joy and always a concern, as he just put it. She had heart surgery earlier this week, and everything went perfectly, and she is recovering well, but she is on a month-long journey of hard recovery, and so we pray for her and for Doyle and his family as they journey with her. We want to keep Ruby Denton in our prayers. She is the younger daughter of Jody Denton and the granddaughter of 
Joe and Donna Ford. As many of you know, Landry has had seizures for several years, and this past week, Ruby also had one. And so they are going to Vanderbilt Children's this week, and so we want to keep Ruby and all of the Denton and Moore family in our prayers. Let us go to God. God, we come before you today wanting to feel light and free and dancing before you. But there is a heaviness among us. There is heaviness as we Recognize the violence in our world. There is heaviness as we wait for answers that could change everything. Oh God, we lift up to you these our prayers. God, when our own words fail us, when we are unable to put into words what we are experiencing and thinking and feeling, we give you thanks that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And when we offer you a jumble, you are able to make sense of it and hear. Oh God, we pray for all who live in fear of violence and for those who commit acts of violence. We long for the day when peace and well-being pervade our world and we commit ourselves anew to being peacemakers. We pray for President Trump and for the family of the person killed at his rally. And we pray for the Secret Service agents and all those who protect others. We fervently pray for those who do not have others to shield them from harm in the United States, in Gaza, Ukraine, and around the world. And we ask that you deliver us from acceptance and apathy and to rekindle in us the desire to create a world in which we dismantle the vision. O oh God, we pray these things and all things in your Son's holy name, and it is he who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as we are able as we sing together from all that dwells below the skies, hymn number 101.
not always what we want it to be. But we go forth from this place knowing that we can find glimpses of hope and peace and grace. And that when we are stuck, it's okay if we take a minute to step back, to complete the stress cycle, to remember that even in all that we face beyond these doors, God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.